Prince William returns to royal duty, Princess Kate makes royal history, and Prince Edward takes on his biggest role to date. Plus, a statue of the late queen is unveiled, Prince Louis turns six, and Meghan's podcast is pushed, and Prince Harry officially changes his country of residence. And Kate Ballinger brings us inside a new exhibition highlighting the icons of British fashion. So I think each one has really is really representative of that person's sort of DNA, if you like, and, and tells the story of their brand. We've got that plus so much more in today's Royally Us. Hey everyone, I'm Christina, that's Christine, and welcome to another big week of royal news. Um, you know, not, not too dramatic, which we like, um, so that's always a good thing. But some of the members of the royal family are really stepping up. We're going to go inside this really awesome exhibition, um, highlighting some fashion icons. So, got a good show. Yeah, I think a lot of British and royal history moments, both from tapping into that historical fashion and these new royal appointments that we're going to talk about from uh, King Charles. Yes, let's get right into it. Um, like you said, Princess uh, Kate, um, King Charles is ready to bestow new royal appointments on Prince, Princess Kate and Prince William. So he appointed his daughter-in-law as the Royal Companion of the Order of the Companions of Honor. So this is in a history-making move, Kate is the first royal companion named to this order. So according to the British, according to the family website, the Companion of Honor is a special award granted to those who have made a major contribution to the arts, science, medicine, or government lasting over a long period of time. Past recipients include actress Dame Maggie Smith, physicist Stephen Hawking, politician John Major, and Bishop Desmond Tutu. So not to be outdone, William was appointed by his father to be a great master of the most honorable order of the Bath. The role has been vacant since 2022 after Charles acceded to the throne. So definitely some big news, but making some moves this week. Yeah, it's, it was, you know, hu- these are like historical orders being bestowed upon William and Kate this week. Very, um, very honorable, big like Knights of the Round Table vibes. I am excited about this uh, appointment for Prince William because it is traditionally given to the heir sort of waiting in the wings. The prin- Now King held this role when he was Prince of Wales and further down the line. So this is nice that he's handing it down to Prince William as his heir and hugely exciting for the Princess of Wales to be um, the first history-making royal companion um, of the Order of the Companions of Honor. And this is an acknowledgement of her contributions to the arts from her patronages with photography projects, um, her own photo exhibits, and obviously her hold still photography book. So I think that that's really special. And these are, we say these are sort of bestowed by King Charles. They're, King Charles nominates them to sort of a panel of um counselors who make these final decisions but obviously they're not going to say no to the king it's still really really special and really really exciting for the prince and princess of wales on april 25th prince edward stepped into his biggest role ever leading the royal family in celebrating anzac day which marks the anniversary of the start of the first world war gallipoli landings so it has been a major role enacted traditionally by the king or queen of england so this is edward's most significant duty to date so this is the national day of remembrance for Australia and New Zealand. It is a day to mark the service of members of the armed forces who have served, fought, and died for their country. So this is definitely a big deal. We have seen um, Prince Edward step up in recent weeks since the king was diagnosed with cancer. He and his wife um, have really taken on a lot more than they probably presumed that they would. Yeah, I think they've really stepped up to the plate and and they've always been hardworking. They've always had a number of engagements and patronages, but it's only recently that the spotlight has been on them and they really embraced it and stepped into it. This role especially is is really is really important to to Australians and New Zealanders who have that relationship with the Commonwealth with the British people. Um Anzac Day is a really important date in their in their year as important as uh, Remembrance Day is in the UK and Memorial Day in the US. So this is a big role for Prince Edward and really shows how he is stepping up, getting noticed a bit more and willing to take on these these larger more important roles in service to the king. Definitely. All right. Well, Prince William returned to royal duties after taking some time off following his wife, Princess Kate's 
cancer diagnosis. He visited West London and Surrey on April 18th to raise awareness about the work of community environmental impact organizations in the region. In the region, he observed how the food distribution charity surplus to a, a supper delivers, sorts, and repackages unused food and community groups. Um, he was asked by people how Kate was doing. Uh, he said that she, you know, she is doing well. That he is going to keep checking in on her. So it seems like he is back. Um, you know, kind of getting into the swing of things, which is always a good thing to see. Yeah, it was really nice to see him out and about, really sort of got his hands dirty as he was helping cook in the kitchen. Um, and he received some really lovely cards from from um, members of staff at, from the organization to bring back home to his wife, the Princess of Wales. And he seemed very touched. I'm sure that they have so many cards, they must be swimming in them at this point. But it's still lovely. And I think the Prince of Wales recognizes that people really want to express their sympathy and send their well wishes. And it was just great to see him out and about again. All right. On on April 21st, King Charles and Queen Camilla were photographed leaving a church service um, near Balmoral Castle. Uh, King Charles drove himself and his wife as they waved and smiled at onlookers while departing. This year, that day marks the late Queen's second birthday following her death in September of 2022 at the age of 96. Following their attendance at church, the royal couple, couple likely spent the day celebrating her in private. Grant Harold, who from 2004 to 2011 served on the couple's staff, said that there will be reflections, toasts, and tributes in honor of the late queen, and that they wouldn't do anything public, which we saw. He told Slingo privately, I have no doubt they'll raise a toast to her in the evening. I'm sure the day will be very much spent reflecting on the late queen. He said, I can almost guarantee that if you were to go to Windsor Castle that day, it's very likely there'll be some flowers on the tomb that have been sent by the family members. Sometimes on royal anniversaries, flowers are sent to royal graves. It is very possible there will be flowers on the tombstone. Now, also on April 21st, like we said, what would have been her 98th birthday, a seven-foot bronze statue depicting the monarch as a young woman with a corgi at her feet was unveiled outside the local library in Rutland, England's smallest county. I'm sure she is looking down and very happy about how this statue turned out because, like you said, it has her links to the corgis, which were uh, a staple with the queen. Yeah, I also think the fact that they made her quite young, she looks absolutely beautiful. (laughs) I think, yeah, she'd probably be a bit a bit pleased at the you know i think this new statue really embodies her she's very youthful and vibrant in the statues but she's surrounded by the dogs who are so near and dear to her but it was a really special way to mark um this second anniversary of her birthday since her passing this is the first um posthumous uh memorial or sculpture to be uh, erected in the UK. I do, it, we remember that recently there were some guidelines and limits to what could be, you know, sort of renamed or honoured or done in memory of the late Queen. I think they didn't want, they wanted to avoid a number of pubs, just, you know, mass name changes um, in in this instance. And so this was a very interesting day, still a lot of social media tributes, a lot of articles still discussing the late queen on her birthday, which I think just goes to show how she lives on even, you know, even in death so many years since her passing, she's still such an important and relevant figure. And I do hope that the king and queen had some time to reflect and raise a toast and remember her fondly. Yes, and I love that the sculptor said that he had Instagram in mind when he created this, so you could go uh, jump on the dog's back if you're little, pet them. So it's definitely a a photo op moment, which I think is great. All right, well, let's spill the royal tea, and Meghan Markle is facing a setback as her return to the podcasting world is being pushed back after her $20 million Spotify deal came to an abrupt conclusion. Sources have, uh, have claimed that Meghan will not relaunch her Archetypes podcast this year. So insiders told Richard Eden that that the show has been put on ice, saying the relaunch of Megan's Archetypes podcast got pushed back to 2025. According to sources, Lemonada had concerns about clashes between the Duchess's new Netflix show and her podcasting work. Despite that, sources uh, went on to claim that Megan has a long list of very high profile guests scheduled to participate in her new podcast. Um, I feel like maybe that maybe it's a smart thing. Maybe they just felt like she was going to be oversaturated with all the Netflix things like that. But I don't know. I uh, maybe podcasting is not our thing. <laughs> well, this is, an, you know, we've talked before how Megan is going to be put under an incredible amount of scrutiny, no matter what she does, mm-hmm. what project it is. So I think you're right. This may be a case where they're trying to be really careful, overly cautious, letting American Riviera Orchard launch 
the Netflix series launch and then sort of spreading out this this coverage and this content um, to Megan's benefit. Because when we had the Netflix series and Spare and all these magazine interviews, everything all at once, it was a bit of a dog pile and a huge negative reaction of oversaturation. And we kept talking about how they need to take a step back, uh, be seen a little bit less. <laughs> so this is perhaps, um, you know, learning from those past experiences and just making sure that that oversaturation doesn't happen again. Definitely. All right. Well, this was a big story. So Prince Harry officially changed his listed country of residence from the United Kingdom to the United States on paperwork following his 2020 move to California with Meghan. So the Duke of Sussex filed a notice with the switch in documents at the UK's company's house connected to Travelist, his environmental tourism initiative. Although the date of change was listed as June 6th of 2023, according to documents, the update was only recently made public. So the dated change in country of residence came around the same time that the keeper of the privy purse announced that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex had vacated Frogmore Cottage, their UK residence in Windsor, five months earlier. A spokesperson for both of them, but uh, for the Archwell Foundation, told People Magazine that the couple had been asked to leave the residence. So interesting that you know that was kind of you know last June he changed his country of residence. We're just kind of learning about it now, but it seems like. Montecito is going to be the, um, you know, his permanent home. Yeah, definitely. This is sort of a, a story and a non-story. This might have to do with exactly. taxes, his tax residency, not mm. to dip Harry into a bunch of tax problems. Uh, but it really yes. just means that that is where he lives. It doesn't indicate that he has taken on citizenship or renounced his British citizenship right. or anything like that. It just means that where he lives most of the year is the U.S. So this isn't surprising. We know that they're setting up, you know, literally setting up shop in Montecitos, but it, it is interesting to see that it's kind of a big historical change. No, it really is. You know, kind of like he, like we said, he's putting down roots here permanently. Um, well, this is exciting in our pint size palace. It was Prince Louis's sixth birthday and we got the photo that we were so desperately <laughs> wanting and needing. So the photo was taken by Princess Kate in Windsor in the last few days. Um, People magazine uh, uh, reported. So it came with a simple message from the proud parents. Happy sixth birthday, Prince Louis. Thank you for all the kind wishes today. I know a lot of people weren't sure if we were going to get a photo considering uh, the princess's uh, condition, but nice to see that they did keep up with tradition because we've been getting these photos for quite a few years and he looks so happy. He's so cute. It's such a nice, they're, you know, in the garden on a blanket, it's such a sweet mm. photo. And they made extra sure that we knew that this photo wasn't edited. And I think right. <laughs> as a photographer, there's like a little piece of grass on the blanket. There's like a little scratch on Louis's hand. You know that the photographer in her was dying and just wanted to do a little a little airbrush a little touch up but it was unedited no drama just a sweet picture of a six-year-old little prince uh-huh Loved it. Yes. So yeah, no filters, nothing. Yes. So nobody go with these crazy conspiracy theories. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap things up. This is fun because we are breaking down some history rules uh, this week. And British fashion designers such as Vivian Westwood, Stella McCartney, and Zandra Rhodes are being celebrated in a new exhibition at Blenheim Palace. And we are speaking to Kate Ballinger, the head of collections at the Palace Heritage Foundation. So take a look at this and ogle at all the amazing fashion. How did the designers decide which pieces to put on display? Are these... Are these um, gowns or pieces that we've seen before on, you know, celebrities, even royals, things like that. How do they decide which ones to display? So we had a mixed approach. Obviously, all of the designers and brands are really, really busy. And so when I first approached them, I asked, you know, they could either be fully involved and curate the display themselves, or I would curate or any sort of approach in between, whatever worked best for them. Um, so in a lot of cases, the designers once they were in the space, they worked out what they wanted to say about themselves as a, a brand or a designer and then other messages as well as show sort of the highlights of their career. So I think mm -hmm. each one has really is really representative of that person's sort of DNA, if you like, and, and tells the story of their brand. I love that. Are there um, some like really well-known pieces though that like maybe, you know, somebody that's not fully immersed in fashion that would walk yes. in and be like, oh, I recognize that one. So you would, um, with Terry de Havilland, we've got um, the beautiful Zap Powell shoes that were worn by Amy Winehouse at Coachella, but then yeah. he also designed the shoes for Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
and some shoes recently in Emily in Paris and, and the TV show and just like that. If you go into mm-hmm. Zandra's room, there's not only the dress, a couple of dresses she designed for Princess Diana, there is um, the summer dresses as they're called because they were designed for Donna Summer and appeared on her album covers. Um, Barbara obviously is worn by pretty much every celebrity in the UK yeah. and the royal family. So we have a whole wall of images of all of those. Um, and then uh, basically this, this the, you end with Stella McCartney and there's a huge red carpet section where you've got dresses worn by Stella herself at the Met Gala, but also ones worn by Rihanna and um, Kate Moss, Emily Blunt. You know, there's quite a bit. How do you feel like British fashion has influenced, you know, fashion all over the world? I think um, British fashion, it's unique in that obviously the same way that Britishness is. It, it has mm-hmm. – it is creative and diverse and is very much inspired by cultural and historical events that have happened mm-hmm. in this country and each designers feel that strong sense of history, I think, and they respond to that and that's what makes it unique to other countries. They also are very – proudly British and so many of them like to um, in, include that iconography in their work. So Vivian Westwood obviously was very fond of using a Union Jack and some mm-hmm. of the beautiful Scottish tartans that in, exist in this country. Lulu Guinness has done the same with a lot of her bags, they're sort of Union Jacks everywhere. So I think they're very proud of their Britishness and that come, shows in their collections. Yeah, so I guess if you're in town, um, definitely take a peek because this seems like a um, I must see. Absolutely, it looks like so much fun. Definitely. All right, well, that is it for this week's episode of Royally As. Christine, thank you so much as always. It's another fun week in the royal world. Definitely. All right, we'll see you next week. Keep commenting, keep subscribing.